This is Jose Merino, Editor-in-Chief of the Neurology Family of Journals. The Neurology Podcast provides practical information to neurologists and other clinicians to help them provide better care for their patients. Thanks for listening and have a great week. Hello, this is Hallie Alexander from Wake Forest University, and I'm here today with Shandor Vinitsky. He's a clinical professor at Aarhus University in Denmark. Shandor is an expert on wearable devices and automated seizure detection, and today we're discussing his group's recent work regarding automated EEG interpretation using artificial intelligence. This was published in GM Neurology last month. Shandor, it's such an honor to have you on the podcast today. Pleasure on my side, Hayden. I think everyone's really interested to know what is the AI model that you came up with for reading EEG and how does this model differ from some of the other automated EEG detections that we've seen in the past? So the previously published AI models for analysis of EEG addressed on limited aspects such as the presence or absence of epileptiform abnormality or whether the trace is normal or abnormal. What we achieved is a more more global interpretation of the routine clinical EEG. So what our model does is first separates normal from abnormal recordings, and then it subclassifies the abnormal recordings into the four most important subcategories which are necessary for a clinical decision making. And these categories are focal epileptiform, generalized epileptiform, focal non-epileptiform and generalized non-epileptiform. These are mainly slowings. So these are the most important categories which can help clinicians then to make a therapeutic decision or decision on further workup of the patients. And the other important novelty about our algorithm is that we validated it for a fully automated mode. So most of the previously published models need a human intervention, typically because their specificity is very low. So human experts need to confirm the findings. Now in the test data set, we showed that without any additional human intervention, the model achieves the same performance as the experts. And the name of the model is SCORE AI. And SCORE is the acronym for Standardized Computer-Based Organized Reporting of EEG. Now we published this 10 years ago as a standardized way of extracting the clinically relevant features from the EEG and then use this to generate a standardized report. But then it turned out that the standardized labeling is the ideal input for training an AI model. So that's why we call our model SCORE AI. Excellent. So I can certainly see how this would fill a lot of gaps in clinical care. But how do you envision this being incorporated into clinical practice? Well, this depends on where the clinical practice is. So in the resource limited areas, basically there are no EEG experts. Now in areas where there are experts, SCORE AI could ease the workload. So EEG abnormalities are also highlighted by the model in the EEG recording. So the experts, first of all, would perhaps not need to even to open a recording which is interpreted as normal by the algorithm. And then if the model finds abnormalities, then the model also highlights the abnormalities within the trace. So the experts could go in and then check the markings of the model. Yeah, that's so exciting because as of yet, we don't have anything that is like that yet that can really do that to ease our workload. Is it something that you are using now in your practice? Not yet, because we are waiting for the approval from the regulatory bodies. But as soon as we will have the approvals, I would be very, very happy to put it into our clinical pipeline. And perhaps I I may mention that it will be available on NATO's NeuroWorks, hopefully early next year, but after the regulatory approval. And I would also like to to give the credit to my collaborators, Jesper Zweit and uh, Harald Orlian, who contributed most to the development of the AI model. Yes. And another way I guess I envisioned using it when I was reading your article was just sometimes you get a challenging EEG that could be called either way. And it's nice to ask a colleague, like a tiebreaker, but you know, everyone's busy. So do you ever envision using it in that way? Like when you're in a gray area, wondering if you should call something yes or no, and then you could use the software to weigh in. 
This is indeed an excellent point. And one of our findings in the paper actually could indicate that you could use this for that purpose because we showed that the scorings of the AI model are closer to the average consensus of 11 experts than the average of the individual experts. So you could get a robust majority expert second opinion by doing this automatically with score AI. Yeah. So as this technology improves, then the question on everyone's mind, or at least everyone that interprets EEGs, is what is going to be the role of the human expert as we develop more advanced AI like this that can really operate without us? Oh, I get that question quite, quite often. Shall we stop training clinical neurophysiologists or will AI replace us? I've heard a very good answer and I would like to give the credit to Katja Lin who told me, but I fully agree with her. So she said that AI will not replace us, but humans using AI will. So if we ignore the advances in technology and we ignore the possibilities, the potentials which are in the AI, then the smart humans who will take this as a tool, as a very efficient tool, will probably replace us. Now, again, we should think of this as a tool which has advantages and, of course, limitations. And on the long run, I'm sure that it would help us detect abnormalities in the EEG, which we humans don't see, cannot see it yet. And it also would help us interpret a higher amount of, of EEGs. I just want to clarify that the technology that you've developed was applied to routine EEG recordings um, and specifically Correct. continuous EEG, ICU EEG were not included in this yet. But I'm wondering, are there plans for developing technology to apply to those types of EEG studies as well. Yes, definitely. So we already have an adaptation for long-term monitorings and we are currently testing it. We are in the validation phase of the LTM version. And then the next steps will be training it also for neonatal EEG and also for the ICU. So you mentioned that you worked with some collaborators, of course, and a project like this seems like it would take lots of different input. So who else was kind of on the team that helped to bring this to fruition? Besides the academic participants, decisive influence and the company who developed the model was Holberg EG. They're a company based in Bergen in Norway. And then I want to circle back to something you said about maybe it could even be developed to detect things that humans cannot detect. So just curious how that would work, because my understanding of AI, which is rudimentary at best, is that you can kind of train it um, based on inputs. And then once it's trained, then it can go on to detect things independently. So how do you train it to detect things that we maybe can't detect already? How does that work? So actually, we built that also in the training phase of SCORE AI, because we had this idea of giving more space, more freedom for the AI model. The Previous attempts really limited what trace or what kind of abnormality or what point on the EEG abnormality the model should find. For example, they restricted it to find the peak of a spike. But we thought that there are much more information in the EEG than just the peak of the spike. So we trained the model to find abnormalities within 16 second epochs. So we didn't restrict it to that point in time where the peak of the spike was. And our preliminary, still unpublished results suggest that the model uses completely different features than we the humans. So the next exciting step will be to do a kind of reverse engineering and then see what exactly the model finds. Because the model indeed finds the spikes, but based on different features than what we human experts use for it. And this is called XAI, this explainable AI. And this is one of our next projects to do reverse engineering of the model we developed. Now, we're already talking about the AI maybe even detecting things that humans can't. So we're getting into the realm, which I'm sure you've heard before, of thinking about science fiction and all the things that can kind of go wrong or how it can maybe get out of hand. So in the spirit of just being a dutiful sci-fi fan, I need to ask any words of caution for users about the limitations or risks of using this AI for EEG interpretation? Oh, absolutely. So the first general thing would be that make sure that 
you use a validated AI model and then use the model exactly for that thing that it was validated for. And then when you check the validation studies, then make sure that the AI model is generalizable. So it, it was not over overfit or trained and tested in, in the same data set. Now, with these limitations in mind, I think AI offers us lots of new possibilities. So we should not have uh, an anxiety uh, using these new tools. I think this is rather an exciting new development. I agree, definitely. Very exciting, and I can't wait to see it coming out in clinical use next year. So again, I've been speaking today with Shandor Benitsky about his group's recent publication in JAMA Neurology titled Automated Interpretation of Clinical Electroencephalograms Using Artificial Intelligence. You can find the full article in the August 2023 issue of JAMA Neurology or by the link in the show notes. Shandor, thank you so much for being with us today. Pleasure on my side. Thank you for the invitation, Hayden. This is Stacey Clardy, your podcast editor. If you've enjoyed the podcast, please take a few moments to subscribe, rate, and review the Neurology Podcast through Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen. And remember, you can always head to neurology.org backslash podcast for our full list of past episodes, or you can also search by keyword in your podcast app for any neurology-specific topics you want to learn about. 